I was passing through St. Joseph, Missouri on my way, actually, to go and make some church visit videos in St. Louis, Missouri, maybe four or five hours away on the other side of the state. And lo and behold, St. Joseph, Missouri is a bonanza of historic, architecturally interesting, beautiful churches. And I hadn't planned to be there for any amount of time. Well, I had a couple hours of layover time I could kill. And so last minute, I reached out to Pastor David at the First Baptist Church of St. Joseph, Missouri, because it just looked so interesting architecturally, and it looked like not how Baptist churches looked. I just wanted to know the history. I wanted to get a look at it. And he was willing to let me in and show me around. I told him we didn't have to do like the whole treatment or a sit down interview or anything about what Southern Baptist is, but that I just wanted to know more about their local church and to the story behind this amazing building. The church was founded in the mid-1840s. I think he said in 1897 they started work on the facility you're seeing here, and that it was completed in 1901. Let's go inside the church and take a look at this really unique and beautiful sanctuary together. Oh, my. Check it out. This is incredible, though. I mean, this looks like... A high church church. I was going to say, when you look around at all the wood and the architecture, it is amazing to think early turn of the century when it was built, how that all played out and how that was done. Uh, it's just amazing. I don't remember what you call these like quad vaulted arches that yeah. go together in the middle, but you see this in like super high church European mm. architecture and like the great gigantic cathedrals of the, the West. Yeah. And this is in downtown St. Joseph, Missouri. And you covered the whole thing in this fine woodwork. The quality of the wood is just is amazing. Can I ask you a question about the yeah, stained glass? you bet. I notice that there's not a lot of overt Christian imagery or depictions of any yeah. people. Is that to avoid what some of the more reformed crowd would say is a violation of the second commandment? Is it to avoid a depiction of Jesus? Or is the idea that just, hey, this like is sort of a a Missouri style of stained glass and it's beautiful. Well, I'm not sure about that because I know there's a lot of other churches that, that do have in Missouri do have kind of some of those depictions, but I, I, I think it's probably more of just kind of taking a more humble approach as to projecting the beauty of, of stained glass and those kind of things. Well, you keep using that word, humble, and on the one hand, <laughs> dude, look yeah. around, this is yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> but on the other hand, I do see that Reformation value of not adorning every single thing with the most elaborate depictions of this, that, or the other thing. There's no gildedness. It's, it's wood. It looks a bit more temporal because of that. Yeah. But it certainly doesn't feel low church. No, no. It, Over the history, there's been a, a lot of financial support to, to do some of this, this beautiful stuff. But I think Pony Express it. money? Well, I don't know about that, but I mean... Um, but that's St. Joseph, right? But the, yeah, but Pony Express, yeah. I don't definitely, think they made much money. It's definitely from <laughs> here. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know. <laughs> that was a big money maker. Not to say that the beauty's not nice. I, I mean, of, of some stained glass and some other churches and, and things like that. But you can enjoy the beauty and, and keep the eyes on the Christ. Right. Uh, who is our Savior and Lord. So. Is it okay if we walk up front and I yeah, poke around free. a little feel bit more? Yeah, feel free to wander. Uh, we'll so I noticed the, the congregation is in the round. This looks like it's yeah. 180 degrees. Is that theological in nature as opposed to having a long central corridor or, or is that just the way the design worked out? I think that's just the design, the way that it was designed here. Do you feel that the sort of church in the round layout that you have here is reflective of like, the congregationalism that you guys have? Because church polity wise, mm -hmm. as Baptists, the congregation gets a say, right? Yeah, they, oh, yeah. yeah. They shape it. So. This feels a little bit more like an old Roman Senate House or something <laughs> where everybody's can kind of see each other and interact yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, you definitely, from the pulpit, it's kind of harder. I mean, there's all this vantage point all the way around, oh, but yeah. because you got from side to side where people can sit, I mean. And, and do they sit and over uh, there? Do they do that to you? Occasionally, not very many sit They're on the monsters. sit on the far wings, but like, so yeah, it is, <laughs> you kind of feel like you got to span the whole <laughs> track right. across the entire congregation. But uh, that's one of the things too in here is like, you can have quite a few people in here and it can look like you don't have all that many <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, because mm -hmm. they can be spread out so far. Am I allowed to walk up here? Yeah, feel free. We still have some of the, s some newer things, but still like these chairs. I mean, for example, I mean, those, are, those have been around for a long, long time. Actually, our baptistry is right over here. Oh, it's hiding behind me. Yeah. I knew you were gonna have one. Yeah, 
it actually does kind of hide over here in the corner, it almost seems. Uh, but yeah, and it's, it's quite the tank. You could get a large, large person dunked in that. I hear when they moved this one in, they actually had to take some of the doors out to get it in because it was a little too wide to actually get it in here. That's pretty bad and, uh, you, right? So, <laughs> like, you had to take out the door Sometimes to get, get in the, the back. before the horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you just pop this thing down so everybody so, can see and... Yeah, exactly. And actually now, since we've installed some video uh, cameras um, right up there, oh. we now can actually shoot that feed up here on the screen so that in case people can't see it very well from where they're setting, they can see it up there. So is this when somebody becomes a member of the church and a Christian? Yeah, when somebody comes uh, expressing their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, having uh, believed in Him as, as Lord and Savior of their life, dying for their, their sins, then um, that next step, if you will, was, is to uh, have them express that faith through the, the visible expression of baptism. Baptism, of course, represents the new life that they have been given in Christ. Let me make sure I'm tracking with your yeah. order of operations. Person becomes a Christian by the work of the Holy Spirit, and by their responsiveness to that work. Yes. Baptism then is, you guys would be in the outward expression of transformation that's already occurred. Right, yeah. So then baptism yeah. happens next, and then members of your church, they have to be baptized. So it's one, two, three. Well, in a sense, yeah. I mean, unless they are coming from a different Baptist church. I mean, of course, that gets Oh, they got baptized whole, somewhere whole, else. Whole, whole, yeah. I mean, but if, if it's somebody that just comes in, yeah, I mean, and, and they come forward and we talk okay. and, and dialogue and just to kind of talk with them about where they are faith-wise and make sure that they have made a genuine expression of faith and belief of Jesus. And uh, then, yes, the baptism is, is the visual expression of basically what's taking place in their heart and their life as they've become that new creation, as Scripture talks about. I notice that there's a whole lot of visual access to the platform to you know, where the teaching of the word would happen. I do not see a communion table. Does that just get wheeled out or something? Yeah, actually, we wheel that in when we do communion. Okay. Uh, it's actually back in the hallway. And uh, so, yeah, we bring that in. With it being rounded like, like this, it, it's square, so it oh, kind of yeah. doesn't conform to the architecture, I guess, if you will. What do you require of somebody to be able to take communion here? Um, basically, that they be a believer in Christ. Uh, oh, so mean, I could take communion I here. Mean, and, um, As a uh, non-Baptist. Well, uh, that varies from Baptist churches a little bit. So we don't know I each mean, other well honest. enough yet to say for sure. <laughs> uh, so, so that's really kind of hard to, 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 to give you a definitive answer, I guess, but here, if you will. If somebody, said, but, um, if somebody held themselves out as a Christian and yeah, went to basically, communion, basically here at, at this church, again, it kind of comes back to each local church, kind of has a little bit of its the fine print, if you will, okay. on, on that. And uh, so we here, I mean, First Baptist of St. Joe, we basically, if you're a born-again believer in Christ and you've been baptized, then, then you can partake of the Lord's Supper. I've been to a lot of churches. I've asked a lot of questions. I've met a lot of people. And as I get to know these various creedal, historically Bible Orthodox traditions better, what I'm gradually finding is if the whole church became any one of these, something would be lost. Also, if any one of these went away, something would be lost. Like all of these different expressions exist for a reason. They cropped up for a reason. They've persisted for a reason. They're playing important roles in the whole grand scheme of of God's family, of the, the Christian family tree of reaching the world. Why does SBC exist? What, what does it do really, really well that you're enthusiastic about? I think one of the great things that we do is, is the taking of the gospel into the ends of the earth. I mean, which is one of the things, the final things that Jesus gave us this instruction with the Great Commission. I mean, to go out uh, beginning in our local communities and, and ultimately to reach out to the ends of the earth. And uh, so our, our missionary efforts and just the, the, that network that comes through the Southern Baptist Convention with the help of the cooperative program funding, all those things, like I said, enables us, us to do things, man, realistically, we couldn't do by ourselves. I mean, on a small local level, I mean, even if we had all the Southern Baptist churches here in just St. Joe working together, we would have great limitations. But when you take all the Southern Baptist churches from sea to shining sea across uh, the United States, we're able to come together and, and put the Word of God out there in corners of the world that it might never reach otherwise. Dave, yeah. this was awesome, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to be able to show you a little bit around. What would you do if I just showed up on basically zero notice and was like, hey, I got all this camera, I got a drone and a bunch of stuff, and I just super want to see your church. Would you please show me around on camera with a microphone? 
My guess is you would be mildly horrified, and I would not blame you a bit. That was a very presumptuous thing of me to do. I just happened to run into somebody who shrugged at it and was like, yeah, that doesn't stress me out at all. So huge thank you to Pastor David, to the people at First Baptist Church of St. Joseph, Missouri, for opening your doors to me, to us, on, again, basically zero notice. And how about that? We did get to ask a few questions about... Baptist thought, how Southern Baptists work. I'll still go and do a, an official proper treatment of the Southern Baptist Convention at some point down the road, but it was pretty cool to learn a little bit, a bit more about how they think about baptism, how they think about communion. And it was interesting for me, and, and hopefully for you as well, to even imagine what it would look like to go to a Baptist worship service in a, a space that is drawing on, in a lot of ways, the Romanesque style of architecture. I mean, that groin vault can make a dome in the old basilica style, almost like the Pantheon in Rome. I mean, that was built in the style of very old classical meeting houses and semicircularly in the round and with the stained glass windows that are more pattern oriented than depicting storytelling. All of those things have a lot of theological meaning. Think about it. For a Baptist group, a group that was a little bit later on, even in the Protestant Reformation, the Baptists and their forerunners, the Anabaptists, they got picked on by everybody. Other Protestants didn't like them very much. Catholics didn't like them very much. They took a beating for their belief in adult baptism. And Yet, if you talk to a Baptist today, many will say, we're not Protestants, we're just church. We're, we view baptism and historical Christianity in a way that's consistent and in keeping with the Bible, and they'll really paint a picture of them being connected all the way back to the very beginning. And I, I think they paint a pretty fair and reasonable picture of that. You may be persuaded or may not. And so to go back to a building that looks very Roman, that would look like the style of meeting houses that existed at the, the very beginning of the birth of Christianity, I think that's a little bit of a statement. Maybe I'm reading into it too much. Maybe the original architect didn't think about that at all. But that is a very old build, and it communicates continuity, whether that was an accident or not. Then we talk about the seating in the round. Again, something consistent with the old Roman-style, democratically informed layout of like the Roman Senate Curia. I think you can still see some of that building if you go to the Forum in Rome today. And the idea there was that you had people of varying electoral classes, and even though there was still a hierarchy there, still there was some popular notion of government, especially up till the, the decades just right before the time of Christ and the era of the Roman Republic. I mean, it was kind of democratic, and the people got to weigh in and get together and have meetings and use polity and procedure to make decisions as a group as to how to best deploy the resources of Rome. Well, that seating in the round, to me, communicates the idea that Baptist church polity is more democratic, and that is something of a critique, a point of distinction between how Baptists govern themselves and how Catholics or the Orthodox govern themselves with more of a hierarchy structure. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And again, it doesn't matter if I'm going to a Catholic church, a Baptist church, or any kind of church, whether I agree with every point of the theology in this church or not isn't really first and foremost the point of the exercise. I'm really interested to see the internal cohesiveness and to try to decode a bit of the meaning that is baked into the facility and some of the more obvious elements of the worship. So you might agree with them, you might not, but I, I still don't think those things are present, and it does communicate stuff about democracy, about the agedness and continuity of the tradition that Southern Baptists would view themselves as being a part of. And the third thing, those stained glass windows, they're not depicting any images of Bible scenes. Now, if you go to a Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, even some other, even some Baptist churches for that matter, if you go to any of those, but certainly the old high churches, you're going to see depictions of stuff that happened, the life of Jesus, the stations of the cross even. Why is all of that there? Well, it's so that people in a preliterate or non-literate society could look at those things and 
internalize some of the story. But what's the Baptist value of the Bible? Well, they're going to be in line with that Lutheran idea, and I would say biblical idea, obviously biblical idea, of the priesthood of all believers. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. The curtain of the temple is torn, and everyone should have access to the Bible, and the Baptist assumption, one of their core assumptions, would be everyone should be reading the Bible. That should not be mediated to you by some authority figure who gives it to you in selected doses at selected paces, something I still think is very good and admirable. But the Baptist would say, well, now if the Holy Spirit indwells believers, and if the Holy Spirit opens up the eyes of the believer to understand the scriptures, and if these are to be understood, don't get the stories from stained glass, first and foremost— get the stories from actual engagement with the text for yourself. I don't say any of this to suggest that Baptists would be mad about stained glass. I guess I don't know what Baptists think about stained glass. I can't speak for them on that. I certainly am not saying this to be like, ah, stained glass, man, that's a disappointing concession that you have to make in a preliterate world. No, I think stained glass is beautiful and awesome. But indeed, I think what's going on here communicates a whole bunch of meaning as well. There were other layers and other interesting things that I might note that aren't immediately coming to mind right now. I'll be interested to read the comments and see what jumped out at you. Thanks again to Pastor David for the short notice tour and look at what is really a very different, very remarkable expression of Baptist worship in this particular church. If you like this kind of stuff, I got a whole playlist here on the YouTube channel. I think it's called something like visiting other churches. That's not a very clever name, but effectively the goal is to go and understand how other Christians, creedal, historical, orthodox Christians, do their expression of faith, and I found no better way to do it than to go to the places where other kinds of Christians worship and talk to leaders of different types of expressions of Christianity. So this is fun. Maybe go check out that playlist. You might enjoy it as well. And as always, I would sure welcome your presence over on the 10-Minute Bible Hour podcast. We're working our way through the book of Matthew, but we are about to be done. As I'm recording this, we're two months from being done with the book of Matthew, a massive project. And on January 2nd, 2023, we're going to start a whole new thing, and I would be so grateful if you would pencil that in, figure out how to connect with the podcast, and come and join me on this thing. We are going to go through the entire Bible— one book of the Bible at a time in one day each, a 10 to 15 minute chunk. That's all we're going to get to look at book number one, book number two, book number three. So we're going to work through all of it in, uh, what is it going to be, three months and change every weekday morning. I would love it if you would join me over there. If you're already with me on the podcast, I'd love it if you'd consider inviting a friend or somebody you care about. I'd I'd really enjoy having more people involved in that conversation. All right. Thanks for going to St. Joseph, Missouri with me to look at a really cool Baptist church. Look forward to seeing you around the internet. I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me here on my YouTube channel. Let's do this again soon.